really feel like we should dance our way up there for a, for a minute and get, get things, got things revved up. We're a little bit more in the boom camp um, for this year, so we'll go through um, and give you a bit of an idea of what's happening. But first, most important slide we can show you, um, since the financial crisis um, started, we moved from having our disclaimer at the back of the presentation to the front. So please make sure you read it and sue the bank, not Chris or I, um, for anything that we may get wrong. So very briefly, what we're going to run through is Chris, with the benefit of his uh, experience in Sydney, is going to give a few thoughts on the Australian economy and the outlook for that. I'll come up and go over the New Zealand uh, economy, seeing as I think my passport has expired at the moment, so I haven't been able to travel. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with a bit of a look at the business opportunities for New Zealand businesses in Australia and New Zealand. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Chris. Thanks, Nick. And uh, thanks for having us along here. It's, uh, it's certainly a pretty exciting um, time. And sorry, I don't have an Australian accent, but as uh, Nick mentioned, I've had the last few years working as part of the, the, the team in Australia. And so hopefully I've got a few helpful insights on, on that economy. Um, it was pretty neat uh, listening to these guys talking before. Um, the holy grail, if you like, for economists is this idea of productivity growth because that is the true road to, uh, to higher uh, real wages for the, for the economy. Um, but at a, at, a, at a personal level and a, and a technology level, um, I find some of those concepts quite terrifying. I mean, even this remote is quite scary for me. Uh, so actually it's a relief to know that it's moving in the right direction. Um, some of the reason that stuff's terrifying is because um, we're we are macroeconomists, you know, we talk about the big picture and, uh, and those were micro issues. I agree with Richard's idea that it's often these little ideas that build, uh, that, that really lead to, to progress. But I'm a macroeconomist, so I'm going to start with the biggest picture of them all, which is the world. Um, we, we love tables like this. Um, and I've plotted our forecasts of, uh, of global growth. So this is the first big picture backdrop for the world we're operating in. Uh, the 2014 growth outlook is 3.5%, um, is which is about trend. Uh, not a bad sort of thing to look forward to, um, given that we've had a, uh, a couple of um, slightly sluggish years. Now, for all of the uh, technology and progress we make, um, one of the things that always seems to happen is that developed economies grow somewhere between 1% and 3% usually, maybe a little bit higher from time to time, uh, and the emerging economies uh, grow much faster. So in that sense, um, for all the changes in the world from technology, this picture is still pretty similar. Um, but there's a couple of interesting things going on there. Um, firstly, although we've got about trend global growth forecast for this year, the uh, the developed economies, and New Zealand's one of those, are actually accelerating at the moment. Uh, even Australia's accelerating. You might have heard a few stories about it not going too good, but it's accelerating. Um, whereas some of the other the emerging economies, China and India, the ones on the table, are still growing stronger than global growth, but they're actually decelerating right now. So it's the big economies we're looking at, like the States, uh, the UK, uh, to, to push things along this year. Now, Australia and New Zealand, I've bolded them down the bottom. Um, we're, we're picking up a slight difference between Australian and New Zealand growth. We're, we're growing at about trend right now, um, and we're accelerating to above trend growth over the next couple of years, where Australia had a bit of a slump last year um, and, is, uh, and is picking up towards its own trend growth of around just over 3% over the next couple of years. So. Sub-trend in Australia, that doesn't sound that great, but it's still, uh, there's a lot to like about it. Um, most of the rest of the world would, uh, would probably swap their growth outcomes over the last uh, couple of decades for Aussies. They didn't even have a recession in the, uh, in the global financial crisis, and their economy now is considerably bigger than it was uh, prior to the, to the global financial crisis, which started in 2008. Uh, in contrast, there's other big economies like the UK, which in GDP terms is still a little bit smaller than they were in 2008. So this is pretty enviable stuff. 23 uh, years of uninterrupted economic growth. The other thing with Aussie, if you look at the, um, the fiscal position, again, it's enviable. The, the, the government's struggling to, uh, to rein in a deficit, but their total government debt as a percentage of GDP is not even a quarter of what it is in some of the big economies like the States or, uh, or, or Europe. So in other words, the government, if the economy does splutter along a little bit, has certainly got plenty of firepower 
to uh, stimulate it if need it. The important thing I'd, is I don't think it will, uh, it will need that, uh, that firepower from the government. So why is it spluttering along? Well, the main thing that people have heard about is the, uh, is the slowdown or the end of the, of, uh, end of the mining boom. And that's not quite right. Whenever I think about a boom, there's actually three phases to a boom. The first phase is the price shock, when you get some sort of step up in demand and it causes prices to, to rise. We've seen it in dairy here, we saw it in coal and iron ore in Australia, and of course the driver was demand from China. The second phase, which has been phenomenal for Australia, is the investment phase. Now this is the sexy uh, phase, massive capex, huge wages, people getting paid $200,000 a year to make a toasted sandwich in the outback. Um, now that phase is unfortunately coming to, uh, to an end. Um, but the third phase of the boom, which lasts a very long time, is the, uh, is the export phase. And that really is only getting started now. Now the problem for Australia, is that this phase is nowhere near as labour intensive, um, so you've got a bit of a pothole to, to fill there. It doesn't pay some of, the, some of the big wages, but it does help the economy for quite a few years. And we think the export growth that Aussie's going to see over the next couple of years should add about a percent to, uh, to their GDP over the next two years. So what do you do if you've got this sort of pothole, and I've plotted it here, so this is mining investment as a percentage of GDP. You can see the past booms, mining investment got up to around about 2%. This time around it was uh, more like 6%. And so as that mining investment comes off, you need other parts of the economy to do some of the heavy lifting. Now, what you do want is some of the parts of the economy that can soak up that labour. Uh, so, so construction, uh, non-mining construction, residential construction in particular is really important. And non-mining business capex is also important. Now, when an economy slows, the lead-in phase to the next growth period typically comes through easier monetary conditions. And that process is underway in Aussie. Uh, the Aussie dollar's down around 17% from where it was at in the peak of the, uh, of the investment boom. And of course, the Reserve Bank of Australia has delivered some pretty aggressive interest rate cuts, and the cash rate in Aussie is now 2.5% as it was here until recently. A couple of real positives for Aussie, and if you're doing business there, these are, these are always good stats to see. Um, population growth is really strong. It's running at about 1.8% uh, in, in Australia at the moment. And that's, uh, that's reflecting some pretty strong uh, inward migration. Another thing which is a real opportunity in Aussie is, they've, like us, they've got a bit of a housing shortage, and I think the construction sector over there is looking pretty ripe, and a great place for some of those um, people that can't get paid quite so much uh, driving trucks in the mines can go to. So a similar sort of look to ours there. Now, I, where the rubber hits the road for a, uh, an, a, an economy is the labour market. And the labour market has been pretty soft in Aussie over the last year. Pretty much zero employment growth uh, in 2013, and it's jobs growth that puts money into people's pockets and gets the tills ringing. So a turnaround here is really important, and on that front, the, uh, the signs are pretty good. Um, we have seen job ads uh, start to pick up in Aussie, and the first quarter of this year, certainly employment growth was way more encouraging than it was last year. So that's a really good sign that that uh, important piece in the puzzle is turning. Now one thing that is interesting is the Aussie unemployment rate and the Kiwi unemployment rate are the same at the moment, 6%. The difference is the Aussie unemployment rate's rising up and going beyond that level as their labour market goes through the soft patch through last year. Whereas ours is falling as our labour market really gets underway. And that is affecting uh, some migration patterns at the moment. I'm not the only Kiwi that's come home from, uh, from Aussie in the last year, and we see that as a real strong feature of the, uh, of the, lab of the uh, migration stats. So that gets us on to New Zealand, and at this point in time I'll hand back to, uh, to Nick to, to talk about the Kiwi side of the equation. Right, so just having a quick uh, think about what's driving the New Zealand economy here. Um, key things, the housing market. Um, we've got what's called a housing boom here in, in Auckland particularly, or a housing crisis. That depends on whether you own your house or you're trying to buy one, which side of the corner you are on there. That's contributing to the, the economy. We've got already a pickup in construction growth, and that's going to continue to strengthen going forward. And 
as individuals, we're all feeling fairly confident. There's that strong employment growth, house price wealth gains coming through, and that's going to support consumer spending as well. And another key thing, which I'll talk about a bit more, is the rural sector as well, which has had a really, really strong year. But also, with this strengthening economy and this acceleration in our growth, we are seeing inflation pressures start to creep up. So some other themes are rising interest rates and an exchange rate that's already pretty strong and likely to remain so over the next little while. So first up, there probably aren't too many of you who have cows, I'm assuming, in the backyard, given an IT focus. Um, but I am going to talk about milk prices because it is very important to New Zealand. We've had a really phenomenal run over the last year of quite high prices up until recently and really, really strong production. So dairy production is probably going to be up about 11% for the season that's ending at the end of this month, and we've had phenomenal prices. So Fonterra's payout for the season, somewhere around about $8.50 for every kilogram of milk solid, is going to be a record, and then you've got an 11% lift in production. What we're talking about is an extra $5 billion of earnings at the farm gate for those dairy farmers. So if you do know a dairy farmer and there's a little twitch in the corner of their mouth, um, it's not some sort of nervous tick, it is probably the closest they'll get to a smile. That's a lot of money for one sector <laughs> to be earning. And you know, you know, some of that money will get spent out on the farm, some of it will get spent in the shops as well. It's not just about dairy, we're also seeing pretty reasonable meat prices, rising log prices as well, and part of that is that China story as well. Look, global demand for those commodities is picking up and we've been benefiting from it. So there's a pretty good story at the moment with commodities. Prices of dairy are coming down a bit, production won't grow as strongly, so the incomes probably won't look quite as strong and spectacular as what they do this year. But there's quite a firm underlying trend in those areas. Now, just looking a bit more domestically, um, the housing market, it is starting to slow in the sense of price growth is slowing, sales turnover has fallen um, a little bit. We are going to see a bit of moderation of that, but over the course of the next year, still some reasonable price growth coming through, particularly in Auckland and Canterbury, which are the areas where supply shortages have been quite extreme. So we've got the impact of what the Reserve Bank's doing with its loan restrictions. We do have um, rising interest rates, and that will be a particular influence. And we also do have more construction coming on, so more supply as well. So that sort of stretch in the housing market will start to reduce gradually over time. But we've had some pretty strong wealth gains coming through in those two main centres, which account for about 45% of New Zealand's population as well. And that's an important underpinning um, of our wealth growth and how we feel and how we, and how we spend. Now, talking of construction, um, I'm a Cantabrian who just happens to live in uh, Auckland and, and work here as well, or get, get paid uh, to turn up at work, um, perhaps more accurately. Um, Chris works. Um, so just to give a bit of a sense for the pickup in construction that we're seeing, in terms of house building, about the same level that we had during the last boom. But as you can see from that chart, we're a long, long way from construction actually peaking. We're probably about four, four years or so away from that. Quite a chunk of that is about the Canterbury rebuild, which is really roaring ahead, but we're also going to see more housing construction here in Auckland and a degree around the rest of the country uh, as well. But there's a long way to go. That's a big pickup in that industry um, going forward. There are as many consents for new homes being issued in Canterbury at the moment as there are in Auckland, despite the fact that Auckland's population is so much larger. That just gives you a bit of perspective on that rebuild ramp up that we've seen so far. We've got the commercial rebuild as well of Canterbury. Uh, that is going to be a bit of a slower burn in terms of the progress um, there compared to the house building. We will see a more generalised pick-up in construction as well, more so again around Auckland where the population growth is. So that construction industry is going to be a very important driver um, of growth. Now, key thing about uh, concentrated activity in one area is, is that you do have these sort of multiplier effects. Um, economists do like to come up with multiple syllabic words to try and um, confuse everybody. But really what we're seeing, some key facts, is, is as construction picks up, you need all the materials. So we've already started to see the manufacturing sector crank up its activity. We also need more engineers, architects, project managers, all those sort of support services as well. And it doesn't stop there. You get the flow-on effects through to the broader economy as well. 
Um, builders are doing well, they need a new ute, so they're out buying one. Um, the architects need a new Volvo, um, so they're out buying a new one. Um, the builders are working hard, they're tired and thirsty, they're stopping off for that extra beer on the way home. Um, next stop after that is a bunch of flowers to apologise for being late at home, for working so hard uh, and stopping off at the pub. And that starts to filter the money through the rest of the economy. And that's the sort of story really for this year. It's that broadening of that activity through areas like construction and also the farming sector as well through to the rest of us. And really what we're seeing, we look at business confidence, confidence surveys by sector, we are seeing that impact in terms of when those sectors are looking ahead, what sort of year they're going to have, they're all increasingly confident uh, and we're seeing more intentions to invest, to employ and all that sort of activity um, is going to reinforce that general pick up and growth um, that we are having. So we're looking at about 3.5% growth over the next year which is pretty decent and as Chris said uh, above trend. It will moderate a little bit of some of these really strong factors at the moment, um, ebb a little bit, um, but we're in a pretty solid patch and things really are starting to show some signs of picking up um, after quite a long uh, and very deep recession that we had and a very, very gradual recovery uh, since we came out of that recession as well, which is something we've had in common with a lot of other developed economies as well. And it's about that nature of how broad this global recession um, was. But onwards and upwards is essentially the story um, for our uh, growth. Now, with that comes a rise in inflation, and we have started to see inflation creep up, and it's going to be heading up into the upper half of the Reserve Bank's um, target band, which is 1 through to 3% on average over the medium term. So it's very simple. If you can calculate an average, you're halfway there. If you know what the Reserve Bank means by medium term, you're the rest of the way there. Uh, essentially, medium term means as long a period of time as is needed to get the average of inflation down below 3% would be a historical um, observation. But we are getting those inflation pressures picking up, very evident in the construction sector, particularly Canterbury, as the economy strengthens, as job growth lifts, as wages lift a little bit, there'll also be those broader cost increases coming through as well. So that's why we've seen the Reserve Bank start to lift interest rates off what are some very, very unusual levels. So just to put in perspective, before the first interest rate increase we, increase we saw this year, floating mortgage rates were probably at about a 40-year low. So that's quite an unusual environment. So what we're talking about is the Reserve Bank's had their foot flat on the accelerator for the last few years trying to get the economy to get up some speed. Now that it's gaining a bit of momentum, it's just wanting to gradually take its foot off the accelerator over time as well. There is also that dimension of that high New Zealand dollar. Um, that does mean inflation's generally been held in check by it as it's risen. Um, it has also meant there's a bit of a headwind for some export industries as well, and that's dampened inflation pressures as well. So that's been doing a bit of the work in keeping inflation down too, um, and probably will. But generally we're in an environment where interest rates are going to gradually rise um, over a period of time. And we would say the, the cash rate will go from 25 that it started this year up to about 4.5% by the end of next year. So a steady increase, we're probably going to get three in a row, another one in June, and then we'll start to see the Reserve Bank slow the pace down as it tries to get a sense of what impact those interest rate increases are having in this environment. We're a quite different world to what we used to be um, before the GFC. We've learned things like delayed gratification, which just to distance myself from some of those earlier interesting conversations just means we've learned to put off spending money um, on things that, that we want. And we are a lot more value conscious as well. So all those habits mean how we respond to higher interest rates is probably going to be quite different to what it used to be. Now, just relating these uh, outlooks back to what this means for New Zealand businesses, I think first up, some general comments for New Zealand and Australia about the next boom. One thing to bear in mind is, is that uh, parts of Asia are growing quite rapidly um, in terms of population, but also it's the rise in income. So we're looking at the middle class around uh, Asia trebling from about half a billion people to about one and a half billion people um, over the next uh, number of years, and a slightly ageing population as well. Now what does that mean? Um, key things when people get a bit richer, they want a bigger house, they want a German car, um, they want a French handbag, um, particularly the women as well. Um, and, you know, they want things like TVs, and they like to go to pretty places and look at, look at scenery um, as well. 
So that plays very much into our hands as well as Australia's. If you look at what New Zealand um, can provide, it is the wood and building products for the homes. It is the really good quality food and the wine that people are enjoying. Um, and it's that fantastic, spectacular scenery uh, as well. Um, and that's one role, one role where technology has obviously played a bit of an impact. You go and uh, make a series of uh, movies. Um, you take a very short book and make it into three very long movies and spread it out over time and use a lot of technology in there and it encourages people to go to the middle of a place in New Zealand where most people wouldn't, wouldn't go, for example. And that's the pulling power of things like that. Now, looking at opportunities in Australia for New Zealand businesses, now one of the themes Chris had was that rebalancing. We're moving away from that mining investment towards the other parts of the economy, and particularly what we're likely to see is um, stronger retailing, stronger housing market and the construction around that, domestic manufacturing to support all that, uh, and also over time as the exchange rate moderates a bit, there'll be a bit more exporting sort of manufactured goods and that tourism um, as well. It's a very important market for us. It is our second biggest export market after China now. It's our biggest single market for manufactured goods uh, as well. We have an exchange rate where it's pretty high, but it's likely to moderate a bit over time, and that's going to mean a slightly easier ride on that foreign exchange aspect. Now, looking more at a New Zealand context, um, so areas where we're going to see um, strength that sort of pro those primary sectors, so that's on the farm, and there was a, a brief talk about the role that technology can play in there. If you can imagine farmers knowing exactly um, what their pasture condition is, where they should be putting their fertiliser, who's doing well in terms of producing the milk and what they should be doing, and just the ability to maximise your productivity and run your business efficiently. That's the sort of role that we can see coming through. Those construction industries and all those support activities are going to be very strong over the, over the next few years, really. And we are seeing that lift in manufacturing and retailing. There's quite a domestic um, focus in that, but also that primary sector as well. And that primary sector part of it is a really, really long-term game um, as well, particularly as we get China, India, many other economies um, getting richer, wealthier, and wanting the sorts of goods that we can provide as well. We're also benefiting from strong population growth as well, as that story of people like Chris, um, New Zealanders coming back from Australia and fewer people leaving as well. So there's a greater talent pool here in New Zealand, as well as, of course, stronger population growth means a lot more people eating, um, wearing clothes, um, or, or not, depending on what they happen to be doing on the internet at the time, I guess. Um, and all those sort of technology needs that we, that we have um, along the way. So look, I will leave it at that, and I've left a couple of minutes, so if anybody does have any questions, there are some um, roving mics, and uh, Chris and I um, will be very happy to take any questions um, if you have them. And if we can see you. Well, perhaps if I could kick off, and I'm not sure if my mic's going or people can hear me. Um, in the late 80s, there was a global recession thing happened, um, and in the early 90s, uh, Paul Treasurer described the recession we had to have, meaning Australia. Um, there's some speculation in Australia that they'd bought their way through the GFC, and that's why they didn't really have a recession, and coming down the line sometime for them is a recession they had to have. Is that a uh, concern? The important thing with Australia is that um, they could actually afford to do that spending. You look at the, the government at the time was in a net asset position, um, and like many economies, they've, they've struggled to rein in, the, the government struggled to rein in their deficit, uh, but their, the government deficit is a percentage of GDP. Um, and government debt as a percentage of GDP is still miles better than everywhere else. Um, so they don't need to have a recession because of what they did back then. I think what's incredibly difficult is managing the transition that they're going through because um, this was a, a, a terms of trade shock, a, a, an investment shock that they hadn't seen previously in their history. It's unbelievable to see how much investment was taking place in that mining sector in Australia. So it does leave a pretty big hole, and it will be a real challenge to A, manage that transition, and B, pick up on the next boom that Nick alluded to, which is this, um, this uh, middle-income middle boom in, in, in Asia. And, and unfortunately, 
the timing in the world often isn't quite as what us economists would like. Our example was the Canterbury rebuild didn't really come on quite quick enough and our economy spluttered along for a few years. Now it's really going great guns. The Aussie economy maybe is going through a couple of years like that, but I don't think they need to fall into a big hole. And as I mentioned, they actually still have a bit of firepower because their fiscal position is so good. Uh, I think they can ward off another a downturn if they need to. Yeah, thanks, Nick.